for them or upon them whatsoever himself pleaseth in his sight. All things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in all his commands. To him is due from angels and men whatsoever worship, service, or obedience as Christians. They owe unto him the creator as whatever he is further pleased to require of them. This is a whole lot. I, I hope you are following the reading. So uh, Samuel Waldron uh, have five divisions to this particular paragraph. And let's run through that divisions. I have a little bit uh, modified some of the languages he used. The first thing we, we learn, or that we will learn about God is that we learn about the independence and self-sufficiency of God. God is independent. God is self-sufficient in relationship to us. And what the confession is saying is that God have how many life? All life, all glory, all goodness. And God does not stand in need of any creature. He's self-sustained and self-sufficient. He is not dependent on anything that he has made. In fact, the confession was so deep as to say God is not deriving any glory from us. We don't have any glory that God will suck. We don't have any glory that God will need to fetch to support him. God is self-supporting. We don't support God in any way, form, or shade. And I think the, for some of you that are interested in theological terms, this doctrine also, there's a word for this. It's called as, is aseity. Yeah, as, as a... Do, is it WS? One S. E-I-T-Y. Aseity. God is self-derived. Uh, God is absolute, self-sufficient. God is autonomous. He's not depending on anyone or anything. You see, I'm coming down. Even though it looks so simple, in practical terms, we don't think, we don't relate to God with this knowledge. And it is good we drum it into, your, into our head and heart so that it becomes part of our living and it becomes the controlling factor of our ethics. By way of, let me take, by way of taking a step back, you know, I used to do a little bit of church history. So the, this, this particular paragraph, this particular chapter, to whom was it targeted? The doctrine of the scripture, we learn it was targeted at Roman Catholic theology. It was targeted as at who again? The chapter one. Roman Catholic, Roman Catholicism, then who else? And the Anabaptists, the radical reformers, yes, and so forth and so on, the, the Quakers. Uh, and, and again, and so, 
what, who do you think chapter two is, or which one of the error in this 17th century, or 18th century do you think this particular chapter uh, targets? Mm. Yes, uh, Ima? Do you have atheism in 18th century in, that the church would respond to? Darwinism at this in 1689. <laughs> you are talking of 1689. That is year 1689. When was Charles Darwin born? Good, thank you. You took you took your word back. Good, that is clever. I, I know many. This is not very obvious, but sure, you have an idea. Who or what? Chapter two is targeting. Yeah, Arminianism, 1689. Yeah, not too sure. Actually, this particular chapter was an ax at the roots of the radical reformers. There's an aspect of radical reform, uh, uh, the, the radical reformism that has to do with Restorationism. How many of you have heard that word before? The most radical reformers are restorationists. How many of you have heard the word restorationist in church history? Okay, part of. Uh, why are you guys looking blank? Eliza, have you not read about it? Eh? Okay, what is that? No idea. Okay. Now, is. Uh, part of the weaknesses of radical reform, uh, radical reform, the, the, uh, the radical reformers is that they say there was a great hunger to take his, to take the church back. So there was this thing that that to do with yeah because of the because of the corruption in the church, the original apostolic church has been lost. Let's go back to the early church. That simple way of worship, like. Today we meet in Joshua's house, tomorrow we meet here. That, that normal uh, church life, that was, uh, there's no, no cathedral, no building, just normal, random way of, uh, from formal way of worship and all that. And one of, there were, most radical reformers were oneness in their theology. They were against Trinity, they, they were not, Trini, they, were not Trini, Trini, they were not Trinitarian in their theology. That's what, that's, that, that's where this is going. Yeah, they were oneness in their theology. They were restorationists. And chapter two is after, uh, after them. Okay, you can read around it for yourself. Uh, I can recommend church history. What is that in my office? Um, okay, I forgot. Now. You can recommend some church history. You read around it. You, you help. So let's read scriptures. This, this idea that God is independent and self-sufficient, let's run through some scriptures quickly tonight. If you have a microphone, uh, you can also help me read. Uh, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 says, talking about God. 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I read. Okay. Which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and holy sovereign, the king of kings and the lord of lords. Yeah, he is the only sovereign, the king of kings and the lord of lords, referring to God. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 26. John chapter 5, verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, yeah. so he has granted the Son also to have, to have life, life in, in himself. himself. The Father has life in himself, in and of himself. Acts chapter 7, verse 2. Acts chapter 7, verse 2 says, And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me, the God of glory 
appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. The idea there is that God is a God of glory. Psalm 148. I'm not hearing you opening the Bible. Okay. So that it will look like it, these, are, uh, these are formulations of men. Uh, Psalm 148, verse 13. Let him praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Yeah. Psalm 119, verse 68. Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and do good. God is not just the doer of good. God is good. God is good in and of himself. Therefore, he does what is good. Job chapter 22, verse 2 to 3. Job chapter 22. Can a man be profitable to God? Surely he... Can you start again? Yeah, and more calmly. Job chapter 22, verse 2 to 3. Can a man be profitable to God? Surely he who is wise is profitable to himself. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty if you are in the right? Or is it gain to him if you make your ways blameless? Mm. I, I mean, if you hear what that... I mean, if I'm a righteous man now and I'm doing so good, or, or, the idea here is this. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to come to the balance later as to if our righteousness and good deed does matter to God. But the idea that we must establish here is that God is self-sufficient. God is self-contained. He does not need anything outside of himself to make him more God. And there's nothing that can be separated from God that will make him less God. Uh, and, uh, okay, let's just read one more scripture. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 25. Acts 17, verse 24 to 25. You, you can recite that off head, no? Romans, Acts 17, verse 24. The 25. And as he reasoned about righteousness. No, I don't think so. Acts 17, 24. The God who made the whole world. Yeah. The God who made the whole world. The God who made the world and everything in it. Being Lord of heaven and earth. Does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives yeah. to all mankind life so and is, breath. God and is everything. not served. This is a distinction between the living God and every other gods. If you go to Buddha temple and you place the image of Buddha in a particular place, where you have placed Buddha, that's where Buddha will be. Many of us are from rural areas where idol worship is quite physical, so there will be an image that people bow down to. If you don't bring sacrifice to the gods, the gods will go bad. In fact, there are some, there are some families back home that their children has gone to the city and nobody is, no longer, no, nobody is serving the idols anymore. What happened to the shrine now? Cobwebs, the shrine begin to disintegrate, the grass starts falling, then there's a lot of weeds, and then after 10, 20 years, it's over. If you don't serve, in fact, many of our family members that are not Christian have to go home once in a while to give their forefathers food to eat. Some masquerade will even come out during the masquerade festival in my place, and they'll be reporting to some of the children that are not responsible. Say, so you're not responsible. Your dad is hungry. Your grandfather is hungry. Yesterday, yesterday we, we, we have to borrow him our own food. 
That is in the place of the dead. And you see people crying. I, I, I knew of, I, I think I, I ran home on, on Thursday, and there was this guy that just had, um, the, he just brought his father out. I don't know how to explain to you. Your late father, you're going to bring him back in the way of, by way of masquerade now, not physically, but he's going to come back as a masquerade. That guy has spent less than 10 million to bring his father out. To bring his father out. Yes, he lives in this city, a rich man, and a churchgoer. They, they bought clothes, they bought everything, they paid the man that was going to be in that mask, 10 million, everything, 10 million, more than 10 million. And when this man came out, his children were crying. He was mimicking their late father, they were crying. And how he has been hungry for too long, and they killed cow. Every other girl need to be served. If you don't serve them, they are finished. Church, are you getting the idea? So that your service to, you should not think that your service to, your service to God is an addition. That if you don't give an offering, if you don't dance, if you don't sing, if you don't come to church, God will say, hey, hey, oh, I'm, I'm finished, I'm dying. No, no, God is self-sufficient. That, I don't know how many churches are in Nigeria. If all of us close down today and say no more church in Nigeria, what happened to God? Huh? What if we gather and say, God, we don't go worship you again? No, God, way, way. And then we put Bibles together, put kerosene and put fire. What happened to God? You sure? Hmm? So if on Sunday night we refuse to open the door of this church, what happened? Nothing. Nothing. You must put that as a cap, swallow that one into your brain. As, as a matter of first principle, that God is not served. It's not waiting for you to bring something for him to eat or drink. You don't make God happy. That's the first principle. That God is independent and self-sufficient. That is point one. Secondly, in the confession, we we'll read that he is the, that God is sovereign over us. The idea of sovereignty is what? Who can give me a simple idea? If you say, this is, if you say something is sovereign, what does it mean? Church. Like Nigeria is a sovereign nation, so what does that mean? The word sovereign. I can't hear you. Uh, you have enough microphones now. Yeah. It has authority. Sovereignty means authority. Yeah, it's a component. Yes, uh, Brother Emmanuel, what is sovereignty? To add self-governing authority. Self-governing authority. Yeah? Your mind is on fire today. Sovereignty. God is sovereign. Look at what the confession says that he is alone fountain of all being. It means every existence proceeds from where? From God. God is the fountain, the the, the uncaused cause through whom as to whom are all things and he hath most sovereign dominion over all creatures to do, to do by them, for them upon them whatsoever himself pleaseth unquote Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. The book of Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You can pass the microphone around. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created how many things? All things. And by your will they existed and were created. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, we read that before. Romans chapter 11, verse 34. Romans chapter 11, verse 34 to 36. Where is the microphone? 
For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? 36. For from him, for from him, and through him, and through him, and to him, and to him, are all things. Are all things. To him be the glory forever. forever. Amen. 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 Daniel chapter 4, verse 25. Daniel chapter 4, verse 25. That you shall be driven from among men. That is Daniel. Uh, God is speaking to who? Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. That you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Mm -hmm. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew from heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Who rules the earth? Who rules the kingdom of men? God. I, I thought it's Buari. I thought it's India, I mean. I thought it's Saddam Hussein. I thought it's the Queen of England. Who rules the kingdoms of the earth? God. In fact, all this election we are doing, eh? the person that God will hand over this country to next year is already is in his hand. All permutation, they share dollars, they don't share dollars, they share car, they don't share car. As far as God is concerned, he gives us presidents according to his own heart. Either it's for punishment, I think what we are having now is punishment. Either it's for punishment or for our good. It's in his hand. It's not that God is just eating sandwich and then your market say, ah, Father, Nigeria has finished election. I say, okay, who the elect? I say, oh, oh, no. Oh, no. That's not it. Uh, even that same Daniel chapter 4. Let's read verse 34 to 35. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> calm down, calm down. Your Yoruba accent is fighting you now, yeah? <laughs> yes. At the end of the day, I ain't Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Just no, say it. You will say it. Yes. Put the microphone in. I, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh -uh, there's no Nizer. <laughs> now, first of all, is it Nebu? Nebu? Yes, that is the first, that is the way you are going to get it. Actually, that is the short form of Nebu. Nebu is a, is a, a god. Neighbor, card. Card. Yes, you see the C H A D heart. And then you have Neza. Neza. N E Z Z E R. Neighbor card Neza. It's a simple thing. Neighbor card Neza. So how will you pronounce Mahashala Hadbrat if you don't know how to pronounce Neighbor card Neza? Okay, and I'll start all over now. Okay. And don't, don't fold my hand. Okay, sir. Uh -huh. At the end of the days, I, Neighbor card Neza. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, continue. we know what you mean now. Okay. Yeah, Lifted you are my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Mm. All, all the inhabitants of the earth. All the what? Inhabitants. Victor, in where are you coming from? 35. Uh -huh. In what? There's no end there. there. There's end, but you are missing. Okay, continue. Okay. All the inhabitants <laughs> of the earth are counted as nothing, <laughs> and it does according to his will among the hosts of heaven. Yeah. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
I mentioned to you the other time I was with my, my wife, went to visit uh, one prophet that lost his wife. And he said, I said, I said sorry, sir, for, your, for the loss of your wife. Uh, and I wanted to help him from the script. He said, well, as of the moment now, I'm asking God, why? I said, sure. And I asked him, you dare ask him? Sometimes people don't really know God. They just, the, the God they think they know is the God of their imagination. Is the God of, they, they think the God is an ATM card. So I say, we decree and declare by this time tomorrow, God, if, God, is she? Nobody can ask him. Nobody can even question God and say, well, what, what have you done? How, how many of you that have lived long can answer that? At one point in time, somebody asked God, and God answered him. You know they answer that kind of question. Even Job, talk, 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 talk. At the end of the whole book of Job, did God answer Job? He just said, Job, let's talk. Where were you? He said, who, he said, who is that aunt that is darkening knowledge? He said, he said Job, come out. He said, Job, you should tie your waist. Let's talk. And he said, and Job said, oh, I, have heard, <laughs> I have heard of you before. Now, I've seen you. Now I repent in dust and in ashes. God is sovereign. At the same time, my uh, niece... You don't do. You don't do, Victor. The third thing that the confession wants us... The first thing we have learned is God is independent and self-sufficient. Say it after me. God is, God is independent, independent and self-sufficient. self-sufficient. Say after me. God, God is sovereign. sovereign. Or God alone, God alone. is... Sovereign. In the third place, there's confession. I want us to learn that God, I want to know about the absolute knowledge of God. God knows everything, and he knows everything absolutely. Look at what the confession said. Say, in the sight of God, all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite. What, the, what, is, what is the word infinite? Never ending. It's limitless. And then his knowledge is infallible. What is infallible? What is infallible? Emma? What is infallible? It means it cannot be wrong or is wrong. What is it inerrant? Go and update your glossary of error. terms. Eh? Yeah? Without error. Yeah. Infallible Without error means or infallible means what? Without uh, error. Incorrection. What is inerrant? What is falling? His knowledge can never be faulted, can never fail. Now, oh, oh no. Oh, sorry, oh, I, I, I don't know say that so you be last week. And and God is independent of and, and independent upon the creature as nothing is to him contingent. What is the word contingent? What is contingent? Guys, are you sleeping? You sure? I'm not feeling you. George, put put eye on him. Yes, please put eye on him. Uh, I, I, we are, we are, you have been here together since morning, isn't it? Uh-huh. Uh, no, you're honest. Excuses. Contingent. Subject to chance or uncertain. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. You guys are not fast. Eh? And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. King James say, says to him that we have to do. Is that, am I right? Yeah, to that, yeah. give account. Uh, Romans chapter 11, we have read that already. 
Psalm 147, verse 5. Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord mm -hmm. and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Mm -hmm. Acts 15. His understanding is beyond measure. Acts 15, verse 18. Acts 15, verse 18. Known from of old. Okay. I read enough. That's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That is so short, eh? Almost like Jesus wept, eh? Mm -hmm. Now you've added to your knowledge some short verses in the scripture. Eh? Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 11. Uh, verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 11. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. And he said to me, Say thus, says the Lord, So you think, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. Yes. Even the things that comes into your mind, I know. The knowledge of God is it's not that you know, God knows much. You know, like, uh, who is the most brilliant person on earth? Is it Erston? Is it yeah. yeah? Yeah, Ben, Who? The, 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 uh, the one that have highest IQ. Okay. Yeah, it's not even close. It's not that God knows so much. No, you know, big, big, big brother. No, big brother know much. But within <laughs> the big brother's house, within the scope of his camera, isn't it? What? The confession is saying is that there is nowhere in the world. In fact, the big brother in Nigeria or whatever, big brother can only see what you are doing, isn't it? Huh? Can big brother see what is going on in your mind? Huh? No. Okay. Can you actually know what's going on in your wife's mind? Your wife is lying on the same bed with you. Do you know what they are thinking that? Do you know? God knows everything everywhere, even the thing in your mind, everywhere, there's no information, there's no information hiding somewhere that God is not aware of, that God need, need to be informed by our prayer. And God said, oh no. Thank God you might pray today. If you didn't tell me, I won't know that some people have been uh, in the hand of uh, Boko Haram in Bruno State. Okay, Angel, can you dispatch some, um, some angels from the Department of uh, Terrorism in heaven to, you know? You know, remember during Trump, when Trump was losing the election, people like Paula White were, were praying. And he told, and Paula White was telling God that God, they're about to rig a Trump election. Let them dispatch some angels from Africa to reinforce the angels in the U.S. I mean, that's the most stupid prayer I've ever heard. If I was told, I would have just said they are kidding. I, I said, what is it? Is it? And they were just calling angel names. They were calling their names. Oh, yeah. Move. Okay, you move them from Africa. Oh, goodness me. So God <laughs> didn't know that Trump would lose. So the angels that were sent to U.S. to monitor Trump election... Things were slipping through their hands. That they need reinforcements from Africa. Not from heaven, sir, from Africa. So we have more than, of course, we have a lot of angels that the American needs. That's not how things work. God knows everything, including the bad thing that you are going to do tonight and tomorrow and by weekend. All your schemes, your plans. Even if you're a murderer, all the plans you are making to kill, to do ritual, to do your hopeless, as you speak now, God is in perfect knowledge. He knows how you are going to execute it. And if you actually execute it to the end, he knows. But it is the one that allows you to execute it to the end. God is, there's nothing that is outside his purview. 
the confession, what us to know that. If you don't know that, you are going to treat men of God as semi-God. You are going to treat men of God as mediators, as, a, as, as intermediaries. In the fourth place, it talks about the holiness of God. And I think I don't want to say much of that. The holiness of God, Psalm 145 verse 17, Romans 7, 12. When we talk about the holiness of God, it's not so much about his moral quality, like God is holy, God does not sin. It's, it talks to his otherness, other, otherness. God, the idea of holiness, from the word we get sanctification, the, God's separation. God is separate from us. God is this, this distinct, yeah, distinct from us. Even though the Bible says God made us in his image, we are nothing near like God in terms of us. We are forever us. We are forever human. Even in glory, even when we get to heaven, we will never become God. Eh? God will remain God eternally. We will remain creatures eternally. God is holy. He's separated from us. He's transcendent. He's far above us. He's immense. And to even take his name upon my lips, sometimes my heart trembles. And this God must be feared. In the last place, the confession wants us to learn that God does have claim over us. He does have authority. He does have authoritarian claim over us. And the confession said to him is due from angels and men whatsoever worship, service, obedience as creatures. They owe unto the creator. Whatever God wants from us, he takes. That's not the book of Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. Revelation chapter 5. Hebrews, John, Revelation chapter 5. Verse 14. Um, verse 14? Yeah. And the four living creatures said, Amen. Sorry, 5, verse 12 to 14, yeah. Okay. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be bless blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. That even in heaven... At the mention of the name of God, creatures just fall down. Heaven is a continual falling down, giving God worship. Now, uh, and that is where I would say maybe one thing about this idea of us giving glory to God. Because the confession said, God does not derive glory from us. But when we say we give God glory, what are we really saying? And I think what we are saying is that we don't have any glory in and of ourselves that God needs that to be worthy of God. Everything that we have by way of glory, obedience, or sacrifice is from who? It's God. It's like we are giving back to him what is, is his. We are reflecting back. Everything good about us is from God. We don't generate goodness, glory in and of ourselves that we we'll bring to God. So God takes. Oh, I think I like that. Oh, we don't have that in heaven. Bring it in. Oh, we don't have that glory in heaven. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, look at that choir. You know, some people even say when people know, when you go to funeral, pastors say a lot of things to give people comfort that this lady is singing well, and and God think. When I don't enjoy the God, God is jealous that the, the singer is, is singing too much. They need high in heaven. 
And then the reason why this singer died is that God wants, God is competing. It's not, it's not, it's not true. It's not true. But there are two points of application I want to make very quickly. The first thing is that if God is like this, particularly God's knowledge, the fact that he created us and demand that we worship him, what manner of life we should be living, there is a word, a quorum deo is what? Is it Latin or, or Greek? Latin. It means in the face of God. See, whatever we are doing, we are doing in the face of this God, this holy God. Your adultery, your fornication, your stealing, your cheating, your, your whatever, you, whatever we do, even your good deeds, everything is being done before the face of this God. And if you think on the last day, how can God keep account of what I've done in 100 years? Go and check Google. Google have, Google have everything that we've been doing online. How much more is God? You know, sometimes people say when we get to heaven, you know, our, our Sunday school idea was that there's a book, there's a little book in heaven that they are writing. Oh, Felix did, what did he do today? He didn't give his wife money for food. Then Angel wrote it down. Today also, Felix didn't pray. Then there is a list, long list. And then in heaven, angels are just opening. What's your name again? Felix or Felix O. o. And then there are like 1,000 Felix from Nice. Okay, come. Which one? Are you from Ondo State or from uh, Kabasi? I'm from Kabasi. Okay, okay, okay. Then, uh, Angel Mufta will bring another book, and then they bring another book again. And then they are looking. Is that what happened in heaven? In fact, <laughs> if you ever get to that side of eternity, everything that you have ever done. It's as fresh as if you are doing them in the now. Nobody is looking for any record. Records are there. But you will be so aware of your own guilt. Not that God is saying, in the last day, God is judging you. Say, God, eh? You know, there's a story in the book of, in, in Matthew. And I think Jesus is making an illustration to help our understanding. When in heaven, and God said, when I was in prison, you know, visit me. Say, ah, when were you in prison? That we did not visit you. Where were you hungry? And then there was a back and forth. Hmm? Before a holy God, you will vanish. You will vanish. You will disappear. We should be careful how we live our lives. The second point I want to make clear is that if God is this big and independent, does his independency render us useless and meaningless? Are we meaningless creatures? Turn to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, yeah. whom I formed and made. Yeah. Thank you. What of Zephaniah? That is, if you know where Zephaniah is, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Now, so the God will rejoice. He said, I have made you guys for my glory and also rejoice over my people. So how will you respond if, if, if our view of God's independence kind of render us meaningless and useless? And the scripture also points to the fact that we are made for God's glory to give God glory and God actually rejoice over us. How will you respond to that? Who wants to respond to that? Are we meaningless creatures? I've given you scriptures now. Are we really meaning, are we meaningless creatures? If the answer is no, how, who are we? If, we? if we don't add anything to God, we don't make God God, we don't supply him anything, he is, is, he's not in need of anything outside of himself. Who are we? Are we meaningless creatures? Look for microphone so that we can hold you accountable, eh? 
So when, when heresies are coming out of your mouth, we know who is saying that. We don't ask his glory, but it's like we're objects of his glory. We showcase his glory. Hmm. Okay. Another person? Who are we? Are we meaningless? Are we useless? Are we just, just floating around for nothing? If God is not in need of us, are we meaningless? Is the church meaningless? Our singing, our praying, our, 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 is that, is that meaningless? Let me, let me hear your thoughts as we close tonight. Yes, Felix, you are putting your thoughts together, no? I hope you can give a straight answer without introduction, yeah? From the text I was read, mm -hmm. said um, God made us his glory. So it is from his own glory, from his self-sufficiency that he um, expressed his will by making us his glory. So just as you said, nothing that is removed or added to him yeah. changes who he is in an in and of himself. Yes. So we are just an expression of his will within the confines of his own glory. So we being his glory is also it, it proceeds from him as God. Yeah. So yes, uh Roger, any thoughts? Are we meaningless? Okay, what what are your thoughts? Thank you, Felix. I think that is a good one. I think I'm looking, I'm looking at uh, Revelation 4 that talks about the fact that God created us to give him pleasure. Mm -hmm. So in the ultimate sense, God needs nothing. Um, he's self-sufficient. He contains everything, but in his goodness and his mercy, he has created man as reflectors of his glory. Mm -hmm. So when we live lives that glorify him in a sense, in one sense, we give him pleasure. We return glory to him. We give him praise. We give him honor. Not so much because he needs it um, ultimately, but because that's what he requires from us. Yeah. Another person? Any, other, any thoughts? Um, who else? Uh, Josh, any thoughts? Um, Madam, uh, you have any thoughts? Okay. I think, yeah, any, any other person that wants to say anything about this? We are not meaningless creatures. See, we we give God pleasure. We don't pleasure God. Hmm? Yes. They are not two things. They are not. They are not one thing. Yeah. They are two things. And uh, our giving God our meaning, our meaningfulness to God, is to the extent of His own meaningfulness. God is glorious. Therefore, what he made are glorious. Our glory are derivative. So our singing, our prayer, our fellowship, the fellowship of the saints in the Holy Spirit is within the confines of who God is. He does not need us in a real sense. I'm looking for a very simple example that I can, I can give, like, like most parents here can testify that once you've given birth to a child, this is, this is a very bad example, but let me just try. And the child just go to school, didn't turn out to be a very good child. It's still your child anyway. Uh, if your child becomes very prosperous, it, it makes you happy. But the performance of your son does not make you more of a father or less of a father. You are his father, whether he's a good child or a bad child. Is that a good example? Not really a good example. It does not change anything about you being his father. It's a very poor example, actually. Because when your son becomes successful, there's a way you feel by way of you know, your brain can't be swell like that. But God is not like that. But on a different category, when we, when we reflect God, it, it, it gives God pleasure. And when we sin against him, God is angry. And these words are human languages. We call it 
anthropomorphism, just for us to read, have a glimpse of how God and us relate. If not, God, as we learned last week, is without passion. It's not vicarious. No, sorry. It's not, um, it's not unstable in its character. Okay, that's how far we will go today. But the very point you must go away tonight is that this God must be feared. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. He's a God of love, but it's a consuming fire. Nothing shall escape his hands. No evil doing shall escape his punishment. He is full of mercy, keeping covenant to a thousand generations. Yet, he will not acquit the guilty. He will not acquit the guilty. God will punish every sin and wrongdoing ever committed on earth. The only way for escape is that if you have run to Christ, for those who belong to Christ, God laid the punishment due to you on his son. So if you run to him and take hold on him tonight, you escape the wrath of God. If not, God will punish. God will judge. Nothing shall escape his judgment. Any question? Maybe one or two before we close. Or any contribution? Yes, uh, Fire Kemi? Contribution, please. Use the microphone. Okay. Um, I, want, I just wanted to say that um, a lot of, um, the way a lot of people view God today, um, this place is actually addressing it. You know, many people go to church, they, um, they see what they do as an offering, just like uh, the village um, priest, just like the, I, um, the idols that they worship in the village. Yeah. You know, rather than put oil on the idol or whatever they use, you know, they use um, their praise and worship, they use their service as their oil, sort of. And then the pastors, like, represent the priests in the village, you know, where they even see one pastor as more powerful than another. Maybe if you go to this pastor, if it doesn't work, then you go to one that has more power, you know, to solve your problem, mm -hmm. just like they do, you know, with the, this priest in the in the village, just wanted to add. Yeah, and that is very great contribution. Do you know, I think, is it First Timothy that, that tells us that there's one mediator between God and man? And that by the virtue of the death of Christ and his res resurrection, by the virtue of our relationship with him, you have an access to God, <coughs> that a believer does have real, genuine relationship with God unmediated. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. That a, your pastor, your priest, your, your, your reverend, your bishop, your prophet is not standing between you and God. The reason why you worship pastor is that you, don't, you have not really known God. You have not really known God. You, you, there are some persons that actually think they are worshiping God, but actually worshiping their pastor. So that's I can be committing sin and I'm comfortable as long as my pastor is not aware. I say, don't make, make Papa no no, make Papa no no, make Papa no no. Hey, what are the fact that God is in the know now? It's very important that our idea of God fits the biblical idea of God, not the one we derived from our African traditional religion, not the one that we have formed in our brain. God is as described in the scriptures. Roger? Yeah, um, even though you referred to, um, uh, when you talk about God's feelings as anthropomorphisms, but I'm thinking, or thinking aloud, now God's dealings with Israel, it shows when we got angry or God feels, or when they talked about David's sin, that the thing David did displeased uh, the Lord, or in scriptures where Ephesians mm -hmm. for God's scriptures is don't grieve the Holy Spirit or not quench the Holy Spirit. Even though they are representative using human expressions, they express how God feels, does it not point to the fact that God is intimately related to maybe his Christians or his creatures? Or a good example when Paul was persecuting the church, when Jesus met him, he said, Why are you? 
persecuting me. It's yeah. hard for you to kick against the bricks. Yes, I think I, I agree with you. We are talking about the being, you know? In, in, in the area of our relationship with God, what the Bible describes and what we are describing fits that well. But ontological, how do I use the word? The, the nature and the being of God within that inner cycle of the godness of God, God is unaffected by the things he created. That is the doctrine I try to establish. But when it comes to the way he, re, the way he chooses to relate with us as his creatures, those things fit. He does really, the, our, our relationship with God is not a plastic one. It's not a joke. It's not like, I know they feel I'm, I'm, just, I'm just playing with, you know, there's a way you play with children. You are, you are, not, you are, just, you are just not to make them happy. Like, let me just give to you. I don't. It's a genuine relationship. That we just, we just grieve God when we act wrongly. And there's a way God is happy when a sinner comes back home. Yeah, you should know how to put this in, their, in their, the levels of categories, yeah? But when we talk about the nature, the being of God, that inner core, it is what it is. God does not need us to be God. We cannot reduce him and we cannot add to him. But on the layer, in the layer of our relationship with, to God as creatures and creator, those narratives fit properly. And uh, one thing I must leave with you was that what we learned last week was that God is incomprehensible. The study about God, you should not think that we can come to a, a perfect understanding of how this thing functions. But we can have a sufficient understanding about these things for our own good. So you may not, you may not really understand how these things square, but you must live with the tension that God does not need me, but he needs me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not affected. God is not affected by my actions, but God is affected by my actions in a real way. You must live with that tension. And I don't think it's a bad tension to live with. It's like God's sovereignty and God's responsibility. It's what it is. It is what it is. Now you just okay. Thank God, God didn't need me. Oh, make I go and do whatever I do. That my God don't need me. No, that's not the way of, of believers. Now you are the living witness about this because God, the Holy Spirit, is living inside you, isn't it? And there is a real fellowship between him, between you and God, the Holy Spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit, is the third person in the Godhead. Is God living inside of you? That, that, that's immanence. immanence. Yeah, that immanence is quite a genuine and real one. And you can look at your own relationship with the Holy Spirit, how it works day by day. And then that's how, you, how, that's how this thing functions in your head. That's how far we go tonight. Uh, send your questions on the group chat and then uh, we, can, we can continue to discuss about this. But what a mighty God we serve. Let's rest to sing what a mighty God we serve maybe two times and then we will pray tonight. Uh